name is Kevin Trenberth. I'm from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I'm a climate scientist. I uh, specialize especially in uh, changes in energy and water uh, and how they are changing with climate change. I started, I'm from New Zealand and I was not particularly enamored with anything. I, I did a, an undergraduate degree in mathematics and was looking for a place to go and I ended up in the New Zealand Meteorological Service because uh, the connection there was that I had done some work on um, um, fluid dynamics and this was the closest thing to it. But when I started there, there was a pattern I noticed to the weather and uh, I've actually noticed the El Nino phenomenon that, and its effects on New Zealand. And I wrote a couple of papers about this long before most people had discovered uh, the El Nino phenomenon. And so I got into the climate realm mainly through these patterns of weather uh, and their important influences on an interannual time scale. And then eventually you start noticing that, well, these interannual variations are beginning to change in various ways as well, and so you run headlong into climate change. Well, the environment in which all events occur these days is different, and so in fact every storm is different, every event is actually different, it has to be. The trouble is that a lot of them look exactly like the ones that we've had in the past. And the reason is because there's a lot of natural variability, there's a lot of um, spread in the, in the values that can occur naturally. But in actual fact, they're all a little different. But when they're at the high end or uh, at the low end, well the low end is not, they don't occur so much in terms of temperature, but in the, at the high end, then you start breaking records. And that's what we're seeing around the world, increasing numbers of broken records. And associated with the high temperatures, uh, often we have uh, very intense droughts, um, heat waves, uh, wildfires, and, and you know, we're seeing increasing instance, instances of that kind of thing as well. I got into this in a somewhat forced way through what happened after 2009, which was the Copenhagen uh, Conference of Parties meeting, uh, when there was, uh, just before that, this event called Climate Gate. Uh, and uh, I was a lead author in the IPCC uh, 2007 report, a co coordinating lead author of the main chapter. My uh, fellow uh, coordinating lead author was Phil Jones at the Climate Research Unit, and, and that was the computer which was broken into, and all of these emails were stolen and then made public, including a whole bunch of mine. And one of mine went viral. And, uh, and so I, I sort of had to deal with the public uh, reaction to, to these things in, in various ways. And um, I mean, I already was uh, answering many media questions, but I made a deliberate decision at that point that I needed to step up and, and uh, try and increase outreach relating to climate change uh, and try to communicate, especially with the masses of, of the general public, as to why this is a, an important issue. So that's really how I got into the, the idea of trying uh, to communicate more. Uh, and I, I think I've had some success at least. I have a few fans. <laughs> So the, the research I was doing at the time was very much related to Earth's energy imbalance. So when you have increases in greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it traps more energy in the system. And, and so this is one of the symptoms that you expect. But we have measurements from satellites at the top of the atmosphere that are supposedly measuring these things. And then the question is, where does this energy imbalance go? Where does the actual energy go? Most of it goes into the ocean. Uh, and so the ocean heat content increases. That expands the ocean, so sea level goes up. Uh, some of it goes into melting Arctic uh, sea ice. 
Uh, some of it uh, goes into warming the land, warming the atmosphere, and, and this is some of where some of the effects on the, on the weather occur. And so one can, in principle, um, try to track all of these pieces, put all of these pieces together, see how much energy, extra energy there is in the system, and making, trying to make it add up to the values that we think we're measuring at the top of the atmosphere. And at the time, we were quite frustrated because they weren't matching up especially well. And so that's what that quote was actually about, the lack of uh, an adequate observing system in, in a number of ways, especially the ocean observing system, but also the uh, top of the atmosphere measurements that were being made uh, and the discrepancies, the apparent discrepancies between those so that we couldn't track what I called the global warming, which was the actual energy imbalance at the time. That's what the vernacular that I was referring to was, was dealing with. And of course, it was a private email to colleagues who understood the context. And then when it gets out of that context, it maybe doesn't make as much sense. I thought it was ironic that uh, it was a private email, but it was talking about a paper that had been published. So even though there was this, everyone was getting excited about this secret email, it was actually just you were just talking about published research. Well, some of it was published, but in actual fact, I subsequently wrote an article, a perspective that was published in Science Magazine uh, about tracking uh, Earth's energy. And, uh, and that's uh, been a quite popular article, as it turns out. But that was really more of an explanation as to uh, what, what all of this was, was really about. Mm -hmm. most of the energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere ends up in the ocean. And so the ocean data sets were not very good. Uh, they're, they're getting better. One of the reasons they're getting better is we have a new ocean observing system called Argo, which provides a lot better information or, uh, all over the world. Uh, but you know that really only applies to after about 2005. It doesn't give you the record further back in time. But using that information, uh, it's possible to improve the analyses that are being made of the ocean uh, temperatures, uh, the ocean heat content. And, uh, and so this has been done. There are so-called ocean reanalyses where you can take um, a comprehensive framework, a, a, a climate model or an ocean model, uh, with all of the components that are uh, forcing it, the, the changes in the winds, estimates of the surface uh, exchanges with the atmosphere in terms of temperature and, and moisture and so on, um, and create, uh, a, along with uh, sea level measurements and uh, sea surface temperature measurements, put all of these things together and get a much better estimate of the ocean state and its changes over time. And so um, uh, in 2013, we published a, a new uh, reconstruction of the ocean heat content over time. Uh, prior to that, I don't think the ocean heat content estimates were as good. And so this helps to uh, uncover and, and find some of this missing heat that, uh, that we couldn't find earlier. So this, that's uh, one of the things. And what we found was that some of the heat in recent years is going deeper into the ocean. And we were able to trace that back to especially changes in wind patterns in the, in the Pacific Ocean. There have been very large changes associated with a, what is called a Pacific Decadal Oscillation, a Pacific Decadal pattern where, where there have been increases in the trade winds that piled up more warm water in the far western Pacific but left the eastern Pacific relatively cool. And uh, as, a, as a part of that, uh, it has changed some of the ocean currents uh, where some of the heat has gone, and it has had some patterns uh, that have emanated from that region around the world. These tend to occur strongest in the, in the winter time. So in the northern hemisphere winter, they affect the northern hemisphere regions. And it turns out there was a connection into the Arctic and across into Europe. And, uh, and this, uh, we, we believe, led to some of the cold outbreaks that occurred in Europe. At the same time, over the North Atlantic Ocean, there were fewer cold outbreaks, especially in places like the Labrador Sea. And as a result, there was less cooling of the ocean. 
Now normally in the winter time there are these cold dry air masses that come off of North America over the North Atlantic. They produce very cold conditions over the um, North Atlantic. A uh, tremendous amount of cooling and they trigger convection in the ocean. The ocean is uh, stratified with warm at the top, uh, cool down below. And, uh, and as a result it's very hard to move heat down. Uh, instead what you do is, uh, is you can move uh, cool water down through convection in the ocean. But if you turn off that, that cool water going down, the convection in the ocean, it's equivalent to warming the deeper ocean. And this is partly what has happened in the, in the North Atlantic. And so the North Atlantic uh, turned out to be one of the places where it has warmed more than uh, many other places, but we think its origins were actually back in the tropical Pacific. And similarly in the southern hemisphere there's been some very distinctive patterns, especially in the winter time, that have uh, affected the southern oceans. The southern oceans are warming quite a bit, and yet at the same time um, Antarctic sea ice has spread out more in the South Pacific. Uh, that relates to the winds having a, a component away from the uh, continent that have pulled the ice further out and more ice gets generated in behind. But in the places where the, the wave structure um, was from the, from the north, uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula area, there's been a huge loss of sea ice there. But you can't push the, the loss of sea ice uh, too far because you run into the continent. And so there's an asymmetry in, in the southern hemisphere where you can only push the ice in one direction so far, but it can spread out an enormous amount in the other direction. Uh, it means that, that a lot of that sea ice is very thin, but you know this kind of a pattern uh, of the changes in sea ice in the southern hemisphere turns out also to be related to this, these large scale uh, changes that have occurred uh, in the Pacific in particular that have led to more heat going deeper into the ocean, especially in the Southern Ocean, uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, partly in the Pacific, at least uh, below 300 meters, uh, down to maybe 700 meters or something like that kind of a depth, uh, redistributing the heat within the ocean. And so this is a part of the nature of the changes that are going on. Um, we, we certainly think that the planet is still warming, but that warmth is not necessarily being seen right at the surface where it gets manifested in, in the global mean surface temperature. The jet stream um, is, a, is the eastward flowing uh, current of air in the northern hemisphere. It's very much associated with the warmer tropics and, and the higher latitudes. And if there are major um, heating in regionally in the tropics, it produces meanders in, in the jet stream, uh, waves, large scale planetary waves in the jet stream. The biggest uh, source of those waves is associated with the El Nino phenomenon. And, uh, and this has occurred uh, especially over the last uh, year or two in, uh, in December, January, February of 2013-14. There was um, b the beginning of the current El Nino event which is going on. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of precipitation uh, north of Australia or, or slightly northeast of Australia, right on the equator. Uh, and we, we believe that that uh, was one of the triggers for one of these major waves that set up. And so as an example, in that particular case, it spins up um, an anticyclonic flow in the upper part of the atmosphere right in that vicinity, but then downstream there is a trough that forms uh, as naturally occurs in the jet stream. And then the next thing is downstream from that is a big ridge of high pressure, which was this ridge of high pressure that went along the west coast of North America. Uh, this is the very so-called persistent uh, ridge that um, led to the... Resilient. the yes, that's the right, yes. And, and it uh, ridiculously resilient ridge that uh, occurred that led to the drought in California. At the same time, it led to very warm air going right up into uh, Alaska and up into the Arctic, 
Uh, but, uh, you know, if warm air goes up in that direction, the cold air is going somewhere else. And it came down in the next trough uh, in the eastern parts, east of the, the, the Rockies in particular, in the eastern parts of the United States. Very cold outbreaks, uh, breaking some records in some places. Uh, but again, uh, having its origin uh, back in the, in the tropical Pacific. Uh, so this large meander that got set up in, in, uh, in the winter of 2000 and 13-14 uh, led to record dry conditions in California. The, the drought, uh, 2013, was the driest year on record in, in California. And uh, now this um, El Nino, which has been gradually developing um, and spreading a lot of warm water around over the northern hemisphere, likely to make 2014 the warmest year on record. Uh, but that warm water is, is sitting out there uh, it had a very profound effect on the distribution of hurricanes around the northern hemisphere in the, in the northern hemisphere summer. Very active, uh, you know, about double the normal activity in the, in the central and eastern Pacific. A couple of hurricanes went through Hawaii. Uh, very uh, inactive uh, set of hurricanes in the uh, Atlantic as a consequence of this. And so it has ha already had big changes across uh, the northern hemisphere uh, into the Atlantic uh, in the summertime. And now uh, we're seeing some of this, um, the, the developing El Nino helps to pull the, the jet stream further down uh, into California. We're seeing some benefits of that, if you like, this week where it's going to be a fairly rainy week and there was flooding in San Francisco last week, uh, as, I, as I speak at least. And, uh, and so conditions are very different this year than they were last year. Um, the storms that are coming in are benefiting from the fact that the sea temperatures are very warm and as a result there's extra evaporation of moisture that goes into those storms and so the amount of rains that are occurring uh, are prodigious and uh, you know there's been some flooding uh, there's a real risk of uh, major coastal erosion associated with these kinds of things uh, and we're we're seeing this this kind of thing going on so uh, this is certainly being driven in part by the El, the developing el nino this interannual variability but it seems to maybe um, setting the stage for the end of this pattern which has led to the um, the very strong trade winds and the buildup of heat in the far western Pacific that led in part to this uh, super typhoon uh, high end uh, late last year. And, uh, uh, and so that pattern now has changed and the real question is, is this a blip? Is this a one year thing associated with the El Nino? Or is this really uh, signaling the end of this uh, so-called hiatus in global warming and we're really really going into a, a new pattern where we'll see some more consistent warming from this point on. The way I think of uh, both the drought and the and the storms is that these are most for the most part unchanged with regard to climate change. But once they occur, their impacts tend to be uh, much greater than they used to be. And so on the wet side, there's more moisture that gets uh, involved in the storms. It rains harder, and there's very good statistics to support that. But in the case where you have uh, dry conditions, uh, strong, uh, ridiculously resilient ridges being set up along the west coast, then things dry out a little quicker. There's a little bit of extra heat. You know, it's not a great deal, but it accumulates over time because there's no evaporative cooling. There's no moisture to, to take up this heat. And so things begin to dry out. And then once they've dried out, uh, then heat begins to form and you end up with, with heat waves. Then the risk of heat uh, wildfire goes up. And we've seen a lot of wildfires in California uh, over the last year or so and uh, some really, really big wildfires. And so this has uh, major costs uh, attached to it. So, so uh, what one expects then is that the droughts set in a little quicker, they become more intense, uh, they're, they potentially long, are, are a little bit longer lasting because they're, they're, you know, it takes a bit more to, 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 get, to get rid of them. And once you've got a drought, the, the soil character tends to change so that even if you do get some rains, 
the rains often don't soak into the soils. They tend to run off uh, more readily. And so it takes quite a bit. Um, typically, the best thing is, is moderate rains. Really heavy rains are very apt to, to run off, uh, but a prolonged period of, of uh, moderate rains are, are apt to begin to soak into the soils and, and then uh, change the pattern of the drought. I mean, I think the drought has already changed in, in major ways, but people refer to it in different ways. So from the standpoint of soil moisture and uh, many plants, the drought is probably over in many respects, but in terms of the uh, lakes and the rivers and the, the major reservoirs and so on, they're still way down and it's going to take uh, qu you know, quite a few more storms to, to help um, end, end the drought in that sense. This is a, a tricky aspect because sometimes, uh, you know, scientists uh, are, are seeing only a, a little piece of the puzzle, and maybe the piece they're they're dealing with is is fine, but they're not seeing seeing other aspects of it. And so, how uh, one can communicate that without, uh, you know, um, discrediting them altogether. Uh, especially if they're uh, just uh, misinformed or, or their intent is, is fine. I mean, there are a few people who are deniers of climate change and who deliberately go out of their way to, to misinform the public and mislead the public in various ways. And there's always weather going on. And so you can always pick upon uh, a cold outbreak or, or something which seems uh, not to be consistent with the idea that there's global warming going on. Uh, and, and so that's very easy to do if you, if you want to, to do that. And so um, when, when I try to deal with the, with the public in, in general, I, I'm, I'm really trying to reach, uh, I suppose, what you might call the, the large uninformed masses. Uh, maybe that's a derogatory term, but you know, many people are, are just not very well informed about uh, climate change. Uh, the, the, the small uh, percentage of the deniers, we, I'm not going to convince them. And so I've, I've sort of given up on that small cadre. But uh, it, it, I think building the, the general idea that the, the climate is indeed changing, it has uh, big consequences uh, as we go further along, this is what is needed in order to provide the, the uh, goodwill behind uh, politicians who then may be able to uh, address some of these concerns through policy changes of various kinds. Uh, this is quite worrying in the United States because there's a tremendous amount of uh, vested interests, um, especially on the um, fossil fuel side of things, that uh, has brought uh, huge amounts of uh, money uh, to I'm, I'm tempted to say, pay off the Congress in, in many respects or, or to influence the, the arguments in, in various ways and uh, certainly have distorted the public's view of, of just what is going on. Global mean temperature is not the best indicator of global warming. I think if you wanted to choose a single thing, it's probably global mean sea level. So global mean sea level is going up. It's going up at a rate of over a foot per century. We've got very good measurements of that uh, since 1992 when we've had um, uh, satellites in space with instruments that have altimeters on it that are measuring the sea level to millimeter accuracy. And so that's the rate of uh, climate change. Sea, sea level's gone up two and a half inches uh, since that time. And part of that is because the ocean is expanding, because the ocean's getting warmer. We can actually measure that. And part of it's because of melting glaciers and melting Greenland and so on that's putting more water into the ocean. And so there's no doubt that the planet is warming and this has consequences.